I'd like to introduce Mike Miles, who's with the Wheels of Justice, and he's going to play a song. Oh, he's going to sing to the nice people. Okay, all right. He's going to sing to you nice people. So, hi, hi, Portland. We're happy to be here. And we're going to be at a lot of different events. Let me say a couple of things about the Wheels of Justice before I, before I sing to the nice people is this project has been going on for uh, for about eight years now. The first bus tour started back in like 1999 and it, at that time it was called the Remembering Omron bus tour and the issue that we were focusing in on there was the sanctions against Iraq. Uh, Omron was a 13 year old shepherd boy who was killed by an American pilot in the no-fly zones in the south of Iraq one day when he was uh, watching his sheep and, uh, and for some reason Omron and his herd of sheep were, were targeted and he was killed with a, by a cluster bomb that was dropped uh, out of this American plane and the Washington Post was in the area covering the story so we learned about Omron and that was a time when when 5,000 children under the age of five were dying every month according to the United Nations and that's, it seemed like that figure was just too much for people to comprehend. They just didn't get the enormity of it. So we thought, well, how about we focus in on this little 13-year-old Shiite farmer who shouldn't have died this way, and uh, maybe people can identify with that. So we, we bought a bus. Uh, we created a tour. It was from San Diego up to Vancouver, British Columbia. September to December 1999 and uh, basically the way the tour works is we go to school so five days a week we're at, we're at campuses uh, usually we're invited by a student organization or a faculty member and uh, we'll, we'll go to a campus park the bus in the middle campus have our tabling going on speak to students all day and then uh, we'll do maybe a class or two during the day and usually uh, in a, in a presentation in the evening in an auditorium. So we, we do that five days a week and then we hang out with people like you on the weekends. And uh, we all energize each other and sometimes we do demonstrations, sometimes we do potlucks. You know, we just kind of do everything to keep busy. Basically, we do a fall tour and we do a spring tour. So we've we've been in all 48 states, some of them several times, well over a th well over a thousand schools. It may be as high as 1,200 or 1,500. Who knows? Mostly universities, colleges, high schools. We've even gone into elementary schools. I've talked to san I've talked to kindergartners about sanctions. That was kind of interesting. So um, we're going to be doing some presentations around uh, uh, Portland for the next few days. And hope hope you can come and see you know some of the stuff that we re like really do. 
Today we're just going to have a, you know, a kind of a little spontaneous fun out here, and we'll say a few things relevant, but right now I'm going to sing. Because um, one of the things I've done along the way, I live in northern Wisconsin, I'm at this place called the Anathoth Community Farm. It's a center for the study of nonviolence, community, and sustainable living. We've built an eco-village from the ground up on 57 acres, and we do lots of activism out of it. One of the things I did along the way is I ran for Congress twice with the Green Party in 2004 and 2006, and uh, ended up being one of the most successful uh, third-party candidates running for federal office in the entire United States, both, both times I did it, on less than $5,000. And it, it was one of those Gandhian experiments in nonviolence where you just kind of do it and see how it feels, and it felt pretty good. And it was a foot in the door to speaking to 600,000 people that you wouldn't have had otherwise. So this is, one of, this is my um, campaign song. I did a, a lot of my own fundraising. I would, like, open my guitar case and busk and sing to the nice people. And This is a song by a guy named Jack Hardy. It's my, one of my favorite songs ever. I ought to know more than I know I ought to know where this road goes I ought to know great literature by heart The history of art, this I ought to know I ought to know more than 1492 I ought to know what the Buffalo Bills do I ought to know more than the quarterback's wounded knee What happened at Sand Creek This I ought to know, but I don't I ought to know more than 14... Oh, wrong... Ver I already sang that one to you, right? I ought to know about the sacrifices made I ought to know ration stamps and air raids I ought to know more than George C. Scott and John Wayne gets shot This I ought to know I ought to know what the drinking gourd means I ought to know more than I have a dream I ought to know about the back of the bus And the crack of billy clubs This I ought to know but I don't I don't know nothing about nothing, but I'm proud to stand up right. I don't know nothing about nothing, but my future looks so bright. Illumined by the light, laugh tracks and sound bites, and a replay to get it right. I ought to know. I ought to know the songs of Joe Hill I ought to know Trotsky, Marx, and Hegel I ought to know about the Haymarket Hangings and the HUAC This I ought to know I ought to know about Oliver Cromwell I ought to know about the Gnostics and St. Paul I ought to know what Jesus really said and who the preacher takes to bed. This I ought to know, but I don't. I ought to know what's buried in the landfill. I ought to know about the clear-cutting bills. I ought to know about pipelines and schemes, what extinction really means. This I ought to know. I ought to know for whom the bell tolls I ought to know the pride and prejudice of Poles I ought to know about Hamas and Hezbollah, Mosaddegh and the Shah This I ought to know, but I don't <laughs> I don't know nothing about nothing But I'm proud to stand up right I don't know nothing about nothing but my future looks so bright Illumined by the light Laugh tracks and sound bites And a replay to get it right I ought to know More than I know I ought to know More than I know We ought to know more than we know
We gotta know more than we know. Okay, Bill Hill, the bus driver, is way too modest. He's more than just the bus driver, especially if you're connected with anything uh, with Central America or Cuba or anything. If you ever go on to SOA, everybody who's been to SOA knows who Bill Hill is because he's one of the main drivers with Pastors for Peace. He's been to Cuba. 30 times, who knows, he always goes down there. He's been the main driver for this Wheels of Justice tour for, yeah, eight years. He probably spent, he's like 90% of the driving happens with Bill Hill. Uh, he knows more than most people could possibly ever imagine knowing. So Bill, talk to the nice people here. He's a Vietnam vet too. Okay. You're gonna have you're gonna have to uh, you're gonna have to collar him because he's being modest. But you're gonna want to talk to Bill. You know, when we get done talking amongst ourselves. Hey there. I just wanted to come up and ask you something. You're the bus driver, right? That's yeah. what I've been hearing about. You know, I know you didn't really want to talk too much, but uh, how many? Uh, you just got done driving to Portland. Uh, we we came down from from Olympia. From Olympia, yeah. yeah. So, so, are you the main driver, or do you got helpers? Well, I have helpers from every time now and then. Uh huh. Not not too many people can take off of work and be on a bus. Yeah. So I kind of gave up working, you know, paying taxes to a corrupt society. You know, wow. So I have plenty of time. Uh huh. And you're making good use of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I appreciate what you're doing, and it, that's a bigger responsibility, and it's a big piece of metal. Yeah. And uh, it's nice that you take that responsibility and help these people do their thing. This is my little website, Joe Anybody. I'm just an average Joe. Right. And I'm doing the video part, you're doing the bus part, and we're all working together. That's right. And I wanted Thanks to just make sure. Here. Yeah, thank you. Right. Um, so you guys are out of uh, Wisconsin too, right? Are you kind of staying there in the Wisconsin no. area? Or? Mike is from Luck, Wisconsin, and Madison's from Connecticut, and I'm from Arizona. And oh, Arizona. It's just like the bus. The bus kind of used to be based out of Chicago uh -huh. with, with Voices in the Wilderness, but then it just kind of like every all the all the people that really were active in it, like Middle East Children's Alliance and Wil Voices in the Wilderness, they just kind of like dropped out. So now it's just like on our own. You're kind of rogue, just yeah. uh, running around. and of our pants. Uh -huh. It's like when we go and do events and places, we pass the hat. That's how we make money to buy fuel. All right. know, we get a few donations from people from time to time, but it's just basically people making it happen. Yep. So, okay, well, good. Thank you. That's more important than, than anything else, I think, is just traveling around and educating people. Yeah, it's very important. Very important. You know, and if you drive this thing down the road, it's like you can't miss this thing on the highway. Uh -huh. so it's like a big billboard running around. Get a lot of good reactions, like thumbs yeah. up and you know, we peace used to signs. You get a lot of one finger peace signs. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah, I've seen a few of those. It's like, you know, I, I never get angry at that because it's like, well, we got one finger, we just got to get the other one. Yeah, they're halfway there. They're yeah, smiling, they're there. noticing, and that's yeah. what you want. And you that's know? the thing, you know. I mean, but coming here, we had people driving along beside us, taking pictures of the bus, blowing their horn, giving us the peace sign. So, Good. I mean, I, it's times are changing. Yeah. And I think as. As things get harder in this country, more and more people are going to wake up and kind of say, we got to right. do something. Right. And if some of us have been leading the way, but right. they'll be joining us. Yep. Yeah. If and they we're don't, they'll be hungry. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And what, what was your name? Bill Hill. Bill Hill. Okay, Bill. Yeah. Right. Well, nice, nice to meet you officially, and I'll probably see you around over the course of the weekend. Right. So, it's really good to be in Portland because most of the work that we do is with people that don't get it, and that's where we want to be. And, and you can imagine that wears you out when you're, um, particularly with, with um, college students who are just barely there or just waking up or maybe not that interested in waking up, but they've got to be in class and this is who you're listening today. And so uh, it's nice to be with the choir every once in a while. We understand you have some big events coming up here for March 19th and we're glad to see that. And uh, March 19th, the bus is going to be in Boise, Idaho, participating in their big anniversary events in, uh, in Boise. One of the things that we've been emphasizing a lot, and it was really good talking to um, 
to Dan. What's Dan's like? Yeah. Because he's one of the original voices in the wilderness, guys. And that's where I got started in Iraq, was going, with, uh, going to Iraq with voices in the wilderness. My first trip was in 1997, when uh, Kathy Kelly called us up and said, Mike, we have, a, we have a Gulf War vet who's going to Iraq. We need someone who knows how to do media. Can you go? <laughs> so I said to Barb, Barb, Kathy's on the phone. She wants me to go to Iraq. What do you think? Okay, go ahead and go. So it was a very interesting time and a very interesting trip because this, uh, this Gulf War vet, is, it was actually Eric Gustafson who came back and went on to start the uh, EPIC, the uh, Education for Peace in Iraq Center. And uh, we flew out of Chicago that day and uh, the way we framed it was Eric was the first Gulf War vet to get to Baghdad and he's going with medicine for kids in hospitals. And uh, yeah, we got a great buzz in Chicago, we went and did the trip. And um, it was a trip that changed my life because it's important for those of us who have been paying attention to recognize that it is not the fifth anniversary of the Iraq War coming up on March 19th. The Iraq War started uh, January 15th. 1991 Martin Luther King's birthday and it's been going on for 17 years we're 17 years into this war you know and the first part of the war it's not the first Gulf War but the first part of the war was the reducing of Iraq to a pre-industrial state it was that 42 days of bombing where the equivalent of seven and a half Hiroshima bombs worth of ordnance was dropped on Iraq. And they very specifically targeted civilian infrastructure. There was a, a defense intelligence agency memo that was released in the, about the mid-90s that spoke about their intent. And what this memo said is that if they could prevent Iraq from providing themselves with potable water for six months, that they, the, the, the nation would succumb and we would get what we wanted. Well, 12 years later, you know, that never happened. But in the meantime, you know, we, we know that during that period, according to, the, again, the United Nations, that 5,000 children under the age of five were dying every month. And we know that when uh, Leslie Stahl from 60 Minutes went to investigate this herself, that uh, Madeleine Albright, whom she interviewed on the return trip, had a question put to her by Leslie Stahl. And the question was, we just got back from Iraq and we've heard that 600,000 children have died. That's more children than died in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. What do you have to say about this? And Madeleine Alb Albright's response, as you probably know, is it's a terrible price, but the price, we think the price is worth it. And that comment went like wildfire across the Middle East. And whenever we went in any public buildings, any government buildings in Iraq, it's on the wall, you know, on that old computer paper that you could make banners out of, you know, that's about all they had then. So there it is, you know, and that sets the tone for the presence of the United States in that part of the world that we target children. And I remember the first time I went into a hospital in Iraq in 97, we walked in and went into uh, an emergency room and there was an oxygen tank in this emergency room with one hose coming off of it and, uh, and a respirator. And around this oxygen tank w were families in chairs with their children. And so cholera gets to breathe for a little while and then they pass it to the kid with typhoid and then the kid with typhoid gets to breathe for a while and then they pass it to gastroenteritis and they get the and this and this oxygen mask goes around the circle of these children in the emergency room in a hospital in Iraq and we're watching this not only in that hospital but in it's multiplied and you know it's the targeting of 
children. That was the front lines of the war, of the U.S. war with Iraq for 12 years, was these children in these hospitals. And we can't forget that. And we can't forget that Bill Clinton and Al Gore and Madeleine Albright and Sandy Berger and Richard Cohen and James Rubin and uh, Bill Richardson were all a part of this group for eight years. The Democrats killed more people in Iraq than Senior Bush and Junior Bush in their hot wars combined. And Teflon Bill walked away from it all. And everybody thinks he's the best thing since sliced bread. And yet they should be under indictment from the International Criminal Court, and yet the, but the U.S. doesn't support the International Criminal Court because of this kind of stuff, precisely because of this kind of stuff. So, I mean, there we were in Iraq. And when you see this and take this all in, it makes you a little crazy. It, makes, it made me a little crazy, you know, because um, you're with the parents when their kids die. And they don't lash out at you, they hug you and you weep together. I mean, it's a little nutty. Uh, I had an opportunity, I told you about Omron, the shepherd boy that was killed by an American fighter pilot. Uh, after we started the tour and decided that this, this is a good idea, it's going to work, we decided that we needed to go get a picture of Omron. So there's a, when we finished the tour in December, there was a delegation going to Iraq in January. He said, go to Omran's village, get a photo. We need this photo. So this delegation goes to Omran, Omran's uh, village, which is just this little rural Shiite farming village. You know, it's in the countryside. It's like where I live in Luck. Uh, it was a big to-do, because when the, when the delegation showed up, they came with the governor of the province, with a truckload of soldiers, with all these officials, you know, the, the people in the delegation, and Harvey Jawir, the dad, couldn't take this. It was just too close to the time when his son was killed, and it was too much. He wasn't there, but a brother was there. Couldn't take this. It was just too close to the time when his son was killed, and it was too much. He wasn't there, but a brother was there. And the people in the delegation talked to Omran's brother, told him what we were doing, showed him photographs of the bus and that we had named it after Omron and we were talking to people about Omron and we were wondering if we could get a photo so we could let people see who Omron was. And so his brother goes into their house, pulls out the only black and white photo that they have of Omron. He brings it over to the mother who hasn't spoken since Omron was killed, she's in mourning. She kisses the photograph, and they gave us the only photograph they had of Omar. Here's the people who were responsible for the death of their son and brother, and they gave us the only photograph they had. And so we took that photograph, and we duplicated it and put it in all our stuff that we have. You can see, if you go on the bus and see that little boy right behind where, the, where you drive in the bus, and you look in the rearview mirror, and you get to see Omron every time you look in the rearview mirror. Well, we brought that back, used it all over the place, and then when I went back to Iraq in 2002, right after 9-11, we made another trip to Omran's village. I wanted to meet his dad and show him what we had done with the photograph, and we did. And we made it back out to, to Tokal Ghaz Lot, and Harvey Jawir was there, and we sat down and had this marvelous visit um, in the courtyard by his house. And I'm a farmer and I have a son who should have been Omron's age and I told Harvey Jawir that every time I look at my son Phil I think of Omron because they should be the same age. And we talked about the farming I did and we talked about the farming that he did and we talked about being American and being Iraqi and it was all very civil and very humbling and the question that we began to ask at that time this is post 9-11, is not why do people hate us, but how can these people continue to accept us after all that we've done to them? That was our question. And that's what we have to continue pursuing with people around the world of goodwill. This is a battle between uh, uh, extremes. And w when you look at all the extremes that are out there, there's some scary extremes out there, whether they're political or religious or whatever they are. How many of them are there? Are there 
you know, 100,000 of them on either end of the spectrum? Are there even a million of them, a couple million of them? Are we going to let six billion of us who inhabit this planet let a million people take us down roads we're not coming back from? I don't think so. And that's why we have to keep reaching out. That's why we do the things that we do in Iraq. That's why uh, we actually started linking Iraq and Palestine together because uh, they're intricately, intricately connected. Uh, one of the things we found out was that the world understands. You know, when Colin Powell made his presentation at the UN and said, look, this is very serious. Iraq is in violation of seven UN resolutions. And we need to show them that the UN is very serious about this. And we go in with shock and awe for the violation of seven, maybe nine, resolutions depending on if you felt that they had satisfied the conditions of, of disarmament. And then on the other hand, Israel is in violation of over a hundred UN resolutions, many going back to 1948, and yet Israel gets four billion dollars a year from the US. So the world looks at that and goes, seven violations, shock and awe, a hundred violations, four billion dollars a year. Then they look at weapons of mass destruction and they see, what, what did we see in Iraq? They had nothing. And then in Israel, we know that they have at least 200 atomic weapons, hydrogen bombs, that can be delivered. We know this from uh, Mordecai Vanunu. We actually know this from Robert Gates. Remember when he got his, in his confirmation hearings as Secretary of Defense, December 6, 2006, in his Senate confirmation hearings, he declares that uh, Iran is, is surrounded by nuclear powers, including Israel. And then less than a week later, and this is what I think is significant there, less than a week later, Ehud Olmert, in an in a interview in Russia, says this, in, excuse me, in Germany, says the same thing. And he talks about Iran, and he talks about them desiring to be a nuclear power like the US, like Russia, like Israel. And see, I've, I simply don't believe that you have two gaffes like that, at that high a level, within a week of each other, unless you're trying to send a message that, yeah, you know, strategic ambiguity is the official policy towards uh, Israel and their nuclear weapons, but when you got that being said two weeks in a row, a signal is being sent, right? So you've got Iraq with no weapons, and they get shock and awe. You have Israel with 200 hydrogen bombs, and they get $4 billion a year from the U.S. And then you look at invading countries, and yeah, Saddam invaded Kuwait, and yeah, the Arab League was doing everything they could to get them out of there short of war. It wasn't allowed to happen. Shock and awe for invading Kuwait. You look at everything that's happened in Israel with the 67 war, with taking the Golan Heights, with taking the Sinai, with taking the West Bank and Gaza, with the shelling of Lebanon and all of that. The world gets it. It's this disparity between the way the U.S. treats Iraq and the way the U.S. has treated Israel for the same stuff. And now, what, the, what Israel is doing is going back into Gaza with what they learned from the U.S. about sanctions. And didn't sanctions work great in Iraq? Wonderful. So, there you go. There's something going on between the U.S. and Israel. The world seems to see it all. No one here seems to see it at all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And that and now we're going to have an interlude before Mazin Kumaseya speaks to us about the terrible situation that's going on. And this is Mary Rose, and we're usually called like Simmons Rose or something like that. All of us are members. All of us are members. All of us are members of the family. I bid you to remember as you carry out your plan. All of us are members of the family of woman and man. So 
summer best were born in the north and south poles where the temperatures on me. Some were born in more moderate zones, somewhere in between. Wherever you happen to squeeze out, whatever the name of that land, all of us are members of the family of woman. All of us are members, all of us are members of the family, and I bid you to remember as you carry out your plan, all of us are members of the family of woman and man. Some of us are shaped like cucumbers, and some of us are shaped like pears. Some are smooth like dolphins and hills, and some are hairy like bears. Whatever your shape or texture, whatever your cosmetic plan, all of us are members of the family of woman and man. Everybody say! All of us are members. All of us are members. All of us are members of the family. And I bid you to remember as you carry out your plan. All of us are members of the family. Some are the color of peaches and cream, and some of pumpkin pie. Some are the color of banana bread, and some of black and white. Whatever color you happen to be, it's plain as the back of your hand. All of us are members of the family of woman and man. All of us are members. All of us are members. All of us are members of the family. And I bid you to remember as you carry out your plan. All of us are members of the family of the woman and man. The earth is growing smaller, and there's no place we can run to. Don't you sometimes wonder what our family is going to come to? I mean, if some misunderstanding somehow got out of hand, wouldn't that be a disaster for woman and man? Everybody. All of us some members. All of us some members. All of us some members of the family. And I bid you to remember as you carry out your plan. All of us are members of the family. Everyone knows. And hello, Pat. Hello, Grace. Hi, Jill.
No, thank you. This is fine. I appreciate it. It's come see you, like come see you all, they say in West Texas. Um, and uh, no, I, I was in Palestine last in July. And uh, before I went on this bus, I called my mom and I said, uh, uh, I'm going on the bus again. You know, and she says, you're still at this, going on this bus every, every few months you go on this bus. Is it doing any good? I said, well, uh, I don't know. You'd have to ask the people I speak to and see if it's good or not. Um, but I think we are doing some good. I think it is important for people to know. I was looking at the side of that building there. And it says uh, it has a quote from Martin Luther King. It says, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And I think that's a very appropriate uh, quote. Unfortunately, in this country, as you know, uh, we have these slogans about human rights, about justice, and so forth, um, but really we don't implement them. And we really have to live up to the slogans that are thrown at us by the government, and we really have to push hard against that. Um, in July, when I was in Palestine, I went in Bil'in, where they have a, a weekly non-violent demonstration. Every Friday after Friday prayers, they go out and pray, uh, and then they go in this nonviolent demonstration. And every Friday, some people get injured by Israelis shooting rubber coated steel bullets at them, uh, stun grenades, and even live ammunition. And I was actually in the front of that demonstration in July 14. And, uh, and the guy next to me, Ibrahim Bornat, who is the, uh, the cousin. Of Yad Burnat, Yad Burnat leads the nonviolent demonstration every week. Um, and Ibrahim was shot in the head with one of these rubber coated steel bullets. And on the bus, if you want, I have that, uh, those uh, samples of those, not, not the one that hit him, but I have samples of those. I have also samples of those funnel grenades and other things. And we go around telling these stories. We tell them to high schools, we tell them to colleges universities and so on. And uh, tomorrow, obviously, as we saw on the sheets, we'll be speaking in public and also Sunday here. And hopefully you can spread the word and encourage people. We don't want to speak to, I mean, most of you here, you already know a lot of what's going on. We want to speak to people who don't really even agree with us and don't even know anything. All they do is watch CNN, Fox News, Read Newsweek magazine, and so forth. Yesterday we spoke at Washington State University in a class, uh, and we spoke at uh, Clark College in a class, and most of the students had never seen anything like that, and they were like, wow, you know, this is, this is amazing. How, how is it that the media is not telling us these stories? How is it that in the past 24 hours alone, 30 Palestinian civilians were killed, 10 of them children, and you saw not a beep of that on the news, whereas a few days before that, when an Israeli was killed by Palestinian rocket fire, it was all over the media. Why is it that we are being insulated about the fact that 10 times more Palestinian civilians were killed compared to Israeli civilians? Why is it that in Washington, D.C., we have a Holocaust Memorial Museum, and we don't have a Native American Memorial Museum or a Slavery Memorial Museum. How come? You know, there's something that doesn't connect there. And I think people need to start questioning their governments for what they are responsible for, what our government is responsible for, not what other people are doing, other parts of the world. Now, when they are doing it using our tax money, it becomes our responsibility. And with Israel, it is our tax money. We've sp spent on Israel over one trillion dollars, with a T, one trillion dollars. This is in a country that now have racked up a debt of nine trillion dollars. And as you know, Iraq war will also end up costing us one trillion dollars plus. This is your tax money, this is my tax money. And we need to speak out. When after September 11, President George Bush came on the news, the first, the first speech he gave, what did he tell the American public to do? 
Go shopping. He said, keep the economy going. Go shopping. No, what we should have first said the American public needs to do is get involved in politics. Get involved, educate yourself, find out why, quote unquote, they hate us. Find out what September 11 means in other parts of the world. What September 11 means to Latin America when September 11, 1973, the CIA supported the overthrow of the Allende regime in uh, you know, a democratically elected government in South America. September 11, 1922, when the British mandate supported by the, Brit by the American government was instituted in Palestine against the will of the Palestinian people. The irony of September 11. That's the kind of things we need to talk about and we need to explore and understand the connections between those things. And that's what we speak about and we tell the story. So we thank you very much for inviting us and uh, hopefully you can just spread the word among your relatives, your friends, everybody come hear us when we have a more formal presentation with PowerPoints and everything tomorrow and Sunday. Thank you. That's what Yvonne and I are doing. We're singing songs that we hope will give people heart. It certainly has given us a lot of heart. So this is called Singing for Our Lives. We are a gentle, angry people. Then another song we can sing along with. We are a gentle, angry people. And we are singing. Just a seeking people. We are just a seeking people. And we are singing, singing for our lives. We are just a seeking people. And we are singing, singing for our lives. We are an anti nuclear people. At least the pacifists are. We are an anti-nuclear people, and we are singing, singing for our lives. We are an anti-nuclear people, and we are singing, singing for our lives. We are young and old together. We are young and old together, and we are singing.
and eyes to carry tethers for to sit in on the floor or to cry or shout of freedom at the hotel of the store. It is a nice, it is a nice. You told us once, you told us twice. But if that is freedom's price, Try negotiations and three person picket lines. Mr. Charlie doesn't see us. He might as well be blind. Now our new ways aren't so nice. When we deal with men of ice. But if that is freedom's price, we don't mind. And this is this is the verse that was written by by Catherine Jurgens uh, a few years ago when there was an attempt to put the FBI and the local police force together in a joint task force. And this is the way she wrote it. It is a nice to get surveillance or go on some secret list. It's not nice to be harassed by cops and called a terrorist. It is a nice, it is a nice. We told you once, we told you twice. Must repression be the price of speaking out? What is the price of freedom in these times? Hey Bill, can I put my camera in here and look at that picture of the, sure. the kids you guys are representing? Uh, that's him there, I'm assuming, right? That's one for you. Oh, thank you.